thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, what I want to start with is, uh, uh, you know, how I first discovered uh, Buchanan, okay. And then I'll talk a little bit about Buchanan, but uh, today's talk, I thought we wouldn't go in too deep into any subject. We have done a lot of explorations on Buchanan, different aspects of uh, uh, Mysore history. So rather than going deep into any particular subject, I thought it would be better to just tell you what the range of subjects that we have, you know, explored over the last few years. Uh, so uh, this picture that you see on the screen is really uh, one of the few photographs that I was able to take well with my DSLR camera. And uh, it's actually from Pavagada. It's a it's very stark landscape, but it's a beautiful one. And in fact, after we, you know, uh, put it on our computer, I realized that there's a person on the, you know, left hand corner. So I was wondering whether it was Buchanan actually at some point <laughs> that we had captured. But uh, of course, Buchanan didn't come alone uh, or didn't do this survey alone. He had a whole, uh, you know, entourage with him from officials and cooks and, you know, painters and, you know, so many other people with him while he did the survey. Okay, so, uh, so uh, the way I actually discovered Buchanan was when I was working on a film by the name of The Curse of Talakar. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the history of Mysore would have heard about this curse. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very uh, kind of uh, amazing construct in a sense because it combines two natural phenomena with you know a genealogical part and we were just not able to uh, understand how this could have been constructed what was you know probably a kind of rational expect uh, you know uh, explanation for this curse uh, we did a lot of research uh, into it and were not able to get any kind of you know breakthrough in understanding how these uh, how this curse could have been you know uh, in some sense created okay and uh, ultimately, I was working in the Mythic Society one afternoon and I came across a reference to Buchanan's journey. Uh, and what they said was he visited a number of places along the Kaveri. So I was quite interested in, you know, uh, checking it out because uh, uh, Talakad is on the banks of the Kaveri. And uh, really, we, uh, you know, I, start, I, I was wondering how I could get access to these books, uh, these uh, uh, the volumes. Uh, you know, uh, written by Buchanan. And to my great surprise, uh, Mythic Society Library did have copies of it. So, you know, uh, I slowly went through it, trying to figure out whether he's really gone to Talakkad and what he has noted down there. And uh, luckily for me, he had been to Malangi. And uh, uh, Malangi is a part of the curse. I think if you know the curse, it says that let Talakkad become sand. Let Malangi become a whirlpool and let the Mysore Maharajas not have sons, beget sons or heirs to the throne. So Buchanan actually stops at Malangi and the report from Malangi was really amazing because it sort of gave me a, you know, a breakthrough in my research. Uh, and what I was amazed was his, you know, noting down of these subtleties and very fine points which you wouldn't expect in a survey. So, uh, what he notes down there is that, uh, you know, there are two Malangis. One is a Hosa Malangi and the other a Tadi Malangi. And the Tadi Malangi had submerged. So, maybe that's one part of the curse where they say Malangi becomes a whirlpool. And then he also notes down that uh, Talakad is actually, you know, uh, under sand already by then. Uh, so, you know, it's very amazing that he... This was probably the first record in black and white of Talakad going under sand. Okay. And uh, he also makes reference to a curse, but not the curse as we know it. It just has one part of the curse, which is uh, a woman crossing the river curses that Talakad would become sand. So then I sort of, you know, try to put everything together from that, from that one, you know, uh, uh, comment that he makes and, uh, figure out that there is actually no reference to the curse in black and white before that. As we know it today, what happens is only in 1876, much later, that uh, in Rice's Gazetteer, we have reference to the three paragraphs or stanzas of the curse. 
and then I, you know, uh, delved further into it and, you know, uh, put it together. And my reasoning was that there was something during, you know, the period 1800 to 1876, which sort of may have led to the construct of the curse. Okay, so that uh, basically it was the doctrine of lapse that I thought could have been one event where they combine these, uh, you know, three stanzas together. So the point I'm making here is that, you know, uh, it was fascinating to find, you know, uh, such a detailed report made by Buchanan. What amazed me was that he cared to, you know, note it down in his, in his survey. Uh, at the same time, I was, you know, uh, got this idea that maybe I should start uh, looking at the other places in his journey and why not retrace his entire journey uh, you know uh, more carefully and you know go in depth and so on okay so that's really the start of my of this uh, project so it's been almost i think 17 years that we started from you know the curse of talakad uh, and so from there we started looking at you know uh, visiting uh, places along his route uh, but before that, let me just say a few words about Buchanan and also about the journey. So there is a lot written about Buchanan. You can find a lot of information about Buchanan. Uh, he's done, you know, uh, work in several areas of India. He surveyed, uh, you know, uh, Bihar. He surveyed, uh, he's gone right up to Burma, erstwhile Burma. He's, uh, he's done a lot of work on, you know, uh, at the botanical gardens in, uh, in Calcutta and so on. Uh, but uh, the journey itself is what I was interested in. I'm not such a you know uh, enthusiastic about uh, the biography of Buchanan, but it's more the survey which amazes me and you know what I focused on. Uh, the journey itself, you know, like uh, in the introduction, it was said that the best way to uh, understand what this survey was about is the title of the book. So a lot of these, uh, you know. Uh, 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 the surveys itself, right? They give, explain, the title explains everything, actually, what it's about. So it covers a wide range of topics there. It's not only about agriculture or uh, mines or, you know, it's also about customs, practices, uh, landscapes and so on. So we have, you know, it's very wide. It, it, it touches upon almost every aspect of life. And uh, the journey itself is about uh, 3,000 kilometers, uh, that's an estimate I made. Uh, he stops at about 300 towns and villages uh, on the route. It takes him about 14 months to complete the survey. And uh, it's at a very interesting point, uh, point of time in history that the survey was done. This was at the end of, uh, with the defeat of Tipu Sultan. And uh, kind of, you know, the beginning of colonial interventions in, in uh, Stwell Mysore. So, uh, like I've said here, it's it's his observations, and obviously these were not his observations always. They were probably told to him by officials and so on. But uh, it's very interesting that he cares to note them down, and you know uh, uh, that's what really was uh, important to me as we went along. Uh, he does mention that he would have liked to abridge the whole uh, survey and make it into one volume, but I think luckily for us. It didn't happen because I think a lot of the nuances would have been lost if he had done that. Uh, so this is a very different perspective of history that you get when you start retracing his route from, you know, how we study history, right? So what we normally see is, you know, stories about kings, queens, palaces, you know, the grandeur and so on. But this is more about everyday life, you know, common people. Uh, and there's a lot of continuity, I feel, in, in this in India. And uh, it's nice to see history in this in this way, right? So, in fact, I was just looking at the photographs which are exhibited outside today, and uh, one of them was making wheels for bullock carts. And uh, uh, you know, we saw exactly the same kind of uh, wheels being made at Gubbi near Tumkur. Uh, of course, they were sort of fixed with uh, you know the metal uh, rims uh, today, but the process was almost the same. So I think if I'm not wrong, these photographs were from the early 1800s or mid 1800s. And you can see exactly the same process being carried out today. So these are the, you know, aspects that we found fascinating and we sort of wanted to, uh, you know, record ourselves. Uh, so let me then uh, 
tell you a little more about the explorations we have made, uh, some of the different places that we visited, what we found there. So uh, one of our first trips was, you know, uh, to a place called Satgadam, which is uh, not very far from Bangalore. It's what I call the old, old Madras road. Uh, it goes via Tekal bypass and so on. Uh, so we visited this place called Satgadam. It's a, uh, we climbed up the fort at that time. I could climb up. I'm not sure whether I can do it today. But we did manage to climb up and uh, it's very interesting. I mean, his observations, like I said, it's very fascinating. So for instance, he talks about a place at the base of the fort called Satgudi. And at Satgudi, you find, uh, he talks about, you know, the uh, Armenians growing uh, oranges and which are supposedly one of the best in the Carnatic. And uh, we did some work on that. So, the, you know, we tried to uh, find whether oranges were still growing there. Uh, we couldn't find it. And I looked at the, you know, the district manual uh, to see that, you know, it's no, since 1895, oranges weren't grown in this area anymore. Uh, but it's also interesting because in Tamil, uh, you know, uh, Mosambis are called Satgudi, right? And uh, probably he was refer, refer, you know, the place Satgudi for oranges, right? He says they're the best oranges in the south. So probably he meant Mosambis. I'm not sure, but you know, it's small things like this and, you know, the Armenian trade and so on that we wanted to explore further. So this was one of the first places that we stopped at. Uh, from there on, we also looked at other places. One was Tekal. You know, these were small, uh, uh, very small towns, villages probably. And he talks about two temples, a Vishnu temple and a Shiva temple. We were able to locate both. Unfortunately, you can see the Shiva temple is uh, in ruins. Uh, but it's interesting. People never, you know, uh, a lot of people wouldn't even know of these uh, temples even in Tekal. Uh, if you ask them, they'll say there is no Shiva temple and so on. But we did find the remnants of this temple. Uh, one of the uh, very interesting places that we uh, found on his route was Pillai Chatram. Uh, this is not far from Chennai. Uh, it's probably about 50 kilometers from Chennai. Uh, uh, I think just after Kanjivaram. On, you know, NH7. Uh, now, he stays there on his second night of his journey. And when we try to locate this, it's just off the highway, maybe a few feet off the highway. But nobody knew about it. So, you know, at that time, we kept asking people, where is this Pillai Chatram? They said, there is no such Chatram and so on. But ultimately, we found a school teacher uh, from nearby who said, there is one, but it's probably, you know, it's an Ashokan ruin. Okay, so it's nothing like that. It's only about 250 years old, nowhere near 2,500 years old. And uh, very unfortunately, you see it's absolutely in ruins. And in fact, uh, when we began to explore more about Chatrams itself, right, there's a whole history about it and how important they were in, you know, for travelers and so on. And it's so sad to see it in this shape today. So the first picture that you see on the left, right, is... Uh, what we what we saw maybe in 2010 and the next one to, uh, you know just next to it is uh, the one which is uh, maybe two or three years ago just before the pandemic and it's it's going down okay it's beautiful actually it's got two courtyards it's, it's a beautiful and you can imagine Buchanan having stayed in one of these rooms and uh, I wish somebody would you know uh, preserve these kinds of uh, you know um, in some sense, a monument, I would say. Uh, we did a 360 degree video of this just to keep it in case we don't find it uh, maybe in the next few years. At least we have a record of, you know, what, what it looks like. Uh, but yeah, it would be wonderful if this was preserved in some way. And the problem is that, you know, when you write about these things, you don't know which way it goes. So you might think that you're, you know, it's a contribution in a sense. People become aware and might want to look, you know, uh, restore it or, you know, uh, uh, preserve it. But what happens is sometimes it goes the other way in the sense that, you know, people abuse it even further. Okay. So uh, people who, uh, you know, 
we found liquor bottles and you know cigarettes and the you know the works there so it's probably used as you know for these purposes but uh, yeah that's what really happens uh we also looked for other chatrams there's another one which he stops stops at which is called uh which he calls vacheru and which is now ocheri so uh i looked for vacheru i couldn't find it on the map because a lot of the place names have changed but then google helped me because he speaks of a tank uh, at at ocheri and which i could locate on google maps and so we went there and that uh but it's gone uh, so there's no chatram there maybe just a small part of it remains today uh the sketch is done by me i don't think it's too good but this is from what buchanan says you know i try to put together what it may have looked like so yeah it's uh, today completely demolished and there's so many so many houses and so on yeah we, uh, you know it's not that we want to preserve everything i mean people are there today living there so uh, you know but yeah you do see these kinds of structures which are disappearing uh, almost gone uh, uh one of the uh, fascinating things i uh, worked on was uh the landscapes of bangalore and around bangalore so uh, you know reading through buchanan uh and looking at some sketches from that time uh, I, as some of you may have come across the sketches of home uh i think in left in home uh it's it's very interesting to know you know to see that what they spoke about is a very arid landscape uh in around bangalore and bangalore was small at that time and even if you look at home sketches right you, you find that most of it was very dry so if you uh, home makes a sketch from you know lal bag uh, one of the towers from lal bag and he uh, you know uh, you can see the uh, the market peta there okay the fort and it's very clearly visible and uh, when we go there today it's not it's completely covered with a canopy right bangalore mostly has a complete green covering if you go to any higher location and look at it so you know this whole idea that maybe it was all forest deforested because of development at some point may not be the right one i think the if you go into the history of bangalore itself i think a lot of uh, trees were actually planted for you know fuel and things like that okay so it it becomes green much later but what what could have happened is a lot of the areas which were forested like magadi and so on uh, those forests may have gone and become more arid today okay so uh, bangalore becomes greener in a sense and the uh, some of the surrounding forests probably have you know uh, been denuded and so on okay so yeah this was one of the things that we worked on uh, a kind of environmental history of bangalore uh, we also did a recent survey of savandurga uh, this was a colleague of mine who worked on this project uh, buchanan at savandurga uh, records almost 105 species of trees uh, and he gives a full list of them both uh, the botanical names which have changed today but he also gives the local names and my colleague uh, lingaraj actually was able to find that most of the species still up, are there today now none of them have really vanished uh, so that's a very positive thing so he did a kind of survey of all the all the species today we can find at this forest uh, yeah and it's very good that buchanan records the native uh, the the local names uh, of these species so he was able to trace them so yeah these were some of the places i won't mention all of them we've uh, stopped in many other places but yeah uh, some of them that we vis visited another aspect that we explored uh, was on you know uh, lives and livelihoods of people uh, so this was the part which really fascinated us uh, in on buchanan's journey because like i said not much history really we look at it this way right we are always uh, talking about the big events and so on but these are important right even today there was going on in the world but day to day life does matter right so you get a better idea of what life may have been 200 years ago uh so yeah we looked at various activities and it's fascinating because you can locate most of them even today uh some of them have actually gone in the more recent past in the last 10 years so on the top left you have you know uh, oil making okay gana uh, which is uh, we found mysore uh, buchanan does talk about it at another location we couldn't find it there 
but we came across it in Mysore. Buchanan doesn't really uh, go to Mysore. Uh, uh, but yeah, they were making it in almost the same way. There was no change in the process. Uh, but uh, what was happening, at, this has gone today. It's no longer there. And the person who was making it told us that the two biggest problems at that time was getting this wood uh, for the oil press. Uh, he used to procure it from a person in Nanjan Good and uh, he was no longer able to get it. So that was, you know, one reason, a difficulty he was facing. The other reason that he told us that his business might not last anymore was because of land prices in Mysore. So it's, you know, sometimes you think this could be because of, you know, a technology and so on, but it might not be. It might be because of some very other, uh, different reason. So he had regular customers for years. He never faced a problem of demand, but land prices, uh, you know, was forcing him out of this uh, occupation. Uh, yeah, so uh, we looked at, you know, uh, the one below that is on coconut charcoal making, which uh, Buchanan speaks a lot about. So coconut charcoal is used uh, by, by goldsmiths and so on. Uh, it's a very pure form of uh, very low sulfur, you know, uh, charcoal, which is used for, you know, uh, melting gold and so on. Okay, so we, you can find that even today. And I would say same process, uh, you know, exactly how Buchanan describes it. Uh, in Kerala, we found boat making in Bepur. Uh, uh, Buchanan makes mention of it. He also says that, you know, uh, they were thinking of using wind technology to cut the wood and so on. I don't know what exactly he meant by that. But yeah, there are such interesting references to, you know, uh, technology also. Uh, you have limestone making, uh, which is prevalent even today. And like I said, it's all made, you know, uh, just the way that Buchanan speaks about it. Uh, shell mining near uh, in coastal Karnataka, near Honavar. That was another place we visited and, you know, we found these. Uh, uh, okay. A uh, very interesting place that we visited was Mathod. Uh, nobody would really uh, probably have heard of this place. So this was, you know, we were planning to make a short trip to the Vani Vilas Dam. Some of you may have heard of it. It's one of the first modern dams in uh, Swell Mysore, probably in India too. Uh, uh, even before the KRS. Uh, and we decided to go via a place called Mathodu. And uh, it's a nondescript town, very small village. And Buchanan records glass making there. Uh, so we we're not expecting to find, uh, you know, people making glass today there. But uh, yeah, what's fascinating, if you see the top left-hand side picture, right, sketch, he talks about a wall to the of the village and next to that the furnaces. And as soon as we enter Mathod, we asked, uh, you know, a shop, local shop, uh, stop by and ask the person there and they said, yeah, you could find furnaces here 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, they took us to the field, probably exactly the same place that Buchanan records glass making at Mathod because it fit, fitted exactly the, you know, description given by him, the wall of the, of the, of the village and then the, uh, and then the furnaces. So we were able to find, you know, crucibles and so on with glass in them. Uh, uh, you know, the people take us to the uh, head of the village. We spend time. He calls 20 people, uh, you know, uh, to listen to what Buchanan has to say about, uh, you know, the about the village. They're so happy to learn that somebody actually records uh, the history of that small town. And uh, yeah, you know, it, we found it very exciting to be able to find uh, these kinds of remnants. Now, Buchanan also makes a very nice um, uh, mention there of, you know, the, lo the local people telling him that 100 kilometers from Mathod is a place where they could have built a dam. Uh, this was 200 years ago when Buchanan was there. Uh, and what happens actually is 100 years after Buchanan's journey, uh, the Vani Vilas Dam is built at the same spot. Uh, so... Uh, like I said, what's fascinating is Buchanan cares to note down these kinds of points, which I think were, you know, gave us something to really, you know, explore in that sense. Uh, uh, the next, uh, you know, project that we did was 
a documentary film on coarse blanket weaving. So this is an occupation that you'll find across Tumkur. And, uh, you know, we, we were amazed to find that they're making coarse blankets exactly the same way that Buchanan has described it. So he, he's got a kind of elaborate description of the process where they use tamarind paste and so on to soften the, the wool and the blankets. And we found, you know, the entire village, this was a small village in Tumkur district, uh, almost 100 people making uh, coarse blankets. They also engaged in agriculture, but, uh, you know, during the summers and so on, they work on coarse blankets. And we did a documentary film on that, trying to capture, you know, just uh, the lives of these people. And that's where I became interested in also making ethnographical kind of films to, uh, you know, uh, these films don't have music and, you know, drama and so on in them. So, but yeah, they just capture the act, you know, the life of these people. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a full length documentary, but yeah, I've, it's available on, on the YouTube for those who are interested. But uh, this was really something that we, we found absolutely fascinating. Uh, since then, we've also been making other ethnographical documentaries along Buchanan's journey. Uh, some of them may not be directly, uh, you know, uh, what he speaks about. But yeah, uh, there's some mention of it. So we did something on the Iruligas uh, uh, near Bangalore. We have worked on, you know, some of the fishing communities along the coast and also on shepherds. Okay, so we've done several documentaries of these kinds uh, along his journey just to keep a record of, uh, you know, life there. Uh, <clears throat> Finally, I would uh, like to touch upon, you know, uh, my own passion, which is, of course, academia. So I have I come from an economics background and, you know, I always some, uh, somewhere down the line get back to economics uh, and look at things from that perspective. So uh, Buchanan is not only about places and, you know, uh, things like that. I found that it's rich with data. Okay, so uh, he's got a lot of data on on wages, for example, of, of, of different, you know, uh, People engaged in different occupations, agriculture, in um, you know, iron smelting, uh, weavers, uh, and just even uh, you know, uh, agricultural workers and so on. So, I was wondering whether I could use this data to you know look at uh, something deeper uh, in erstwhile Mysore. He's also got price of uh, prices of various commodities uh, like ragi, rice you know, all the kinds of uh, cereals and uh, vegetables and so on. So I wanted to explore whether I could do something with this, with this data, because it's, it's not very often that you come across data for the years 1800. You get data more, you know, uh, towards the uh, 20th century, but not so much in the 1800s. Uh, the late 1800s, perhaps, but not early 1800s. And, uh, I looked at, you know, what I could do with this data and I came across what is called the Great Divergence Debate. Uh, it's one of the hottest debates in, in economic history today. Uh, and what uh, historians are trying to understand is where, you know, there's a divergence between the, uh, 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 the growth rates uh, in the West and the rest of the world. Okay, and the rest includes uh, India, Japan, China and so on. And uh, what most of the uh, historians actually argue is that, uh, you know, growth, ra growth rates in Europe actually uh, diverge from, you know, India and China and so on around the 1500s or maybe 1600s. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to check whether we could use Buchanan's data to say something more because this is data at the beginning of uh, colonial interventions, right? So we have a very good, uh, you know, uh, point of reference here to work with. So I put the data together. Uh, like I said, there wasn't much on India. There's a lot on China, which was discussed, but not much on India. There was a work by an uh, historian called Prasannan Parasarthi, who 
who studied the wages of real, what we call as the real wages in economics uh, of weavers uh, in in uh, Coimbatore and so on. And he does use some of Buchanan's data, but not uh, most of it. And I put down all the uh, data that I could find in Buchanan, maybe about 80, 70, 80 data points. And what I found was that in 1800, uh, the real wages in this region were on par with Europe. Okay, so, but what happens is that most, even Prasanna and Paratasarthi looked at uh, rice as the staple. So when I looked at ragi as the staple, I found that consumption levels in uh, erstwhile Mysore could have been on par with that of Europe. So uh, that was quite an interesting result. And today, I think, uh, you know, in the great divergence debate, I think this has become a kind of reference. Uh, of course, not all accepted. There have been other studies which say that uh, not, it's not been refuted in any sense. But yeah, others say that this couldn't be true. Maybe uh, the arguments against this even today. But I was able to utilize the data in Buchanan. Uh, another area that I looked at was agricultural productivity. So you find a lot of data in Buchanan about agricultural productivity. Uh, you know, he talks about how many uh, quantity of seeds that were planted, what's the output and so on. Uh, and uh, I wanted to see whether the results I'm getting with, uh, you know, the real wages are also consistent with agricultural productivity, right? So are we able to produce that much uh, output in order to sustain those levels of consumption? And to my surprise, I get figures which, uh, you know, prove in some sense show that it's absolutely consistent. The output per, per person in uh, erstwhile Mysore as well as uh, for South Canada, I, find, I found were exactly consistent in the consumption levels that I have spoken about in my earlier paper. So that was, you know, uh, uh, something which I could do from Buchanan's journey. Uh, uh, so that was one area that I worked on. Uh, the other area that I worked on, and these are more academic papers that I worked on from Buchanan's journey, was the history of the rupee. So Buchanan again talks a lot about uh, currencies in uh, at that time you know, in Mysore and Canara and so on. And what he talks about is after the breakdown of, uh, or the uh, breakup of the Vijayanagar Empire, you have the Palegars and so on and the feudatories, right? And the currency system actually is in a mess at that time because you have multiple currencies, uh, you have debased currencies and so on. So one aspect of economics that I was really never comfortable was money and uh, uh, you know, Buchanan sort of inspired me to look at money more carefully. And uh, I thought the best way to start understanding what money is, uh, is to look at its history. And uh, I worked almost five years on this project, trying to understand the history of the rupee as well as uh, the economics of money. So this study, which I did, uh, ended up in a book. <clears throat> so it traces the history of the rupee from 1542 Right, right up to the end of the Bretton Woods in 1971. So uh, it's quite an elaborate study and I would say completely inspired by Buchanan's work. Uh, so yeah, the, you know, for me, Buchanan is not about just stopping along all the places and saying, this is what he saw and this is what we see today. But, you know, you stop at a place, you try to explore something, it takes you on, you know, uh, on a long detour actually, and probably even more than uh, just the journey. So, uh, yeah, this is something I worked on uh, for a long time. Uh, another fascinating subject was the history of the East India Company itself. So, you know, I was, I'm not a historian. So, you know, when I read through Buchanan and, you know, uh, even his introduction, right, he talks a lot about the East India Company there and how he is appointed by them to study uh, my survey Mysore. And... Uh, you know, as you keep making cross references, uh, you know, the history of the East India Company itself is very fascinating. So I was drawn into this and and I, you discover a lot of other people like Buchanan too, like O'Shaughnessy and so on. Very fascinating people. I think the people who came with the company are quite fascinating. 
maybe uh, controversial but uh, nonetheless quite fascinating and uh, you know buchanan's journey was done at a time when uh, you know the the company was engaged in territorial expansions and so on so i got into that part of history and uh, what i argue is that the company itself right uh, it changes from being a merchant to a merchant ruler uh, around 1765 when it you know starts to t- collect taxes and so on and uh, yeah uh, we often think of the east india company as a monopoly uh, by charter right it had a charter to be, uh, you know trade with india it was a monopoly but my argument it wasn't a monopoly actually it, it actually faced very stiff competition uh, from other companies as well as from you know individual traders and so on and uh, it's actually the process of trying to become a monopoly uh, that drives it to becoming a ruler uh, apart from being a merchant and uh, yeah this was a, a, a subject that i worked up on extensively you know once again all this triggered up uh, triggered by buchanan's journey somewhere you know uh when you start trace, retracing his journey you you find so many interesting things that you want to explore further uh more recently i uh i found some very interesting uh work by 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 a trade union leader by the name of george gunton who also did a lot of work uh uh you know on the trade union movement in the us and so on and very int- this was around the 1890s and george gunton actually makes reference to buchanan's journey not many americans would make you reference you know i was quite surprised that an american trade union leader makes reference to george uh, to buchanan's journey and uh, actually he, he he talks about the great divergence he doesn't use the term great divergence but his work really touches upon that and uh, the whole argument is that the great divergence did not happen because of technology it happens because of the of the social wants of people uh, especially the working class and uh, his argument is that if you if you read through buchanan carefully you find that in india social wants were you know something which did not develop the same way as in the west uh, and that's probably what you know why standards of living uh remained what they were in india whereas they they sort of uh, changed in europe and so on so it gives you a demand perspective rather than technology which is a pure supply kind of perspective to the great divergence so this is an area that i have worked on more recently and finally i must make mention of another area that i worked on which is iron and steel smelting so we did extensive work on iron and steel me- smelting uh so you know we we went to several villages along buchanan's route where he talks about iron smelting having taken place uh and almost every place that we went to we could find uh you know locations where you would find this whole huge piece of land maybe a few acres completely turned black okay because of iron smelting and uh you know there were places that we went to people would say no uh, nothing like that happened in these villages but we would be sure that it happened and uh, you know when we went back they would say come back after a few days we'll check it out we'll let you know if there's something like this and they would be actually uh, you know waiting to tell us that yes it's true uh, it did happen here and uh, they would show us these plots of land like i said uh, we could find crucibles slag you know uh, huge plots of land and uh, these are all iron rich places along you know in tumkur district for example right uh, even today it's uh, iron iron mining is quite prevalent uh, so you know one of the questions that we asked here is why did this whole uh, we couldn't find smelters there today so smelting has disappeared uh, completely blacksmiths do exist but not smelting and uh, when we started looking into why smelting may have stopped altogether uh we realized that you know what's missing in indian history is uh 
iron smelting. So we often talk about agriculture being very important. Yes, it obviously very important to you know uh, to sustain large armies and so on. But the iron smelting is kind of completely missed out when we are talking about political history or uh, you know environmental history. So there is a metallurgical history and a lot of people have worked on Indian metals and so on made in India, but not so much about the political history around uh, iron smelting. And uh, I think this is uh, unfortunate because uh, we had very large armies and you know many and, and what we read about in history are battles and you know wars, right? And all this required iron and steel. So who were the smelters and you know uh, what was the kind of impact of uh, this quantum of iron being smelted in India because uh, what we learned was that uh, the fuel for iron smelting is charcoal and uh, charcoal takes a lot of wood to produce. So making a, a kilogram of uh, iron uh, requires almost 100 kilograms of wet wood. So when you're talking about you know, a cannon weighing 40 tons. It takes 4,000 tons of wet wood to make it. Uh, so a lot of landscapes that Buchan talks about are actually deforested because of iron smelting. Uh, now, when I delved into this further, I found that in England, in Sweden, many of the European countries, even in the United States, uh, they talk about huge tracts of forest being uh, destroyed because of iron smelting. Uh, but there was no reference to in the impact of uh, for on forests due to iron smelting in India. And uh, I worked with uh, many of my colleagues on this and we did a lot of work on this. And, uh, you know, sort of tried to incorporate it into environmental history as well as political history. Uh, and yeah, the paper was published ultimately in EPW, which really brings in iron smelting into this whole narrative of, you know, the environment and so on. I think that's completely missed out. I think it's a very important aspect of our history. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of charcoal itself. Un unfortunately, there's no history of charcoal, which has been written. And charcoal was like the oil, right? So it's difficult to talk about, you know, uh, geopolitics today without oil. So, uh, you know, charcoal, unfortunately, is not, uh, the history of charcoal has not been written. I think it's very important if somebody could write that. And uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, this was not, you know, an agriculturally, maybe a very rich area, probably uh, not, uh, you know, well irrigated and so on. There are parts of uh, the Deccan which are very well irrigated. But I think it was also very highly industrialized, uh, you know, if you look at it. Proto-industry was very abundant here. So, especially iron smelting. So, even if you look at, uh, you know, why some of these empires probably existed, you know, in very dry landscapes and so on, it's probably because of their, uh, you know, easy procurement of iron and steel. So, steel is even more complicated to make. Uh, the region is very famous for steel, wood steel, you must have heard of it. Uh, which takes even more uh, wood to, you know, to make charcoal and, you know, remelt the iron and so on to get rid of the impurities, right? So, it takes a lot more uh, uh, fuel in, in some sense to make steel. And just imagine an army of 50,000 people, right? Uh, soldiers, maybe with a sword, with a shield and so on, each requiring maybe uh, 10, 20 kilograms of uh, equipment, maybe weapons. And then you have the elephants, you have the cannons, all that takes a lot of steel to make, right? So who were the people who smelted steel, for example? Uh, so when you go up north, you know the tribes do it, right? Uh, in the south, it's not very clear who did it. We have tried to uh, uh, figure that out, but yeah, it's not very clear. Uh, but in the north, the Agarias and so on. And they were very powerful in that sense. And what we argued is that the tribes actually had a very close proximity to the state because they were the smelters and the state needed the iron for 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 its uh, weapons and uh, but the the tribes were never close to the agricultural communities they were very close to the state but not the agricultural communities and 
when the British come and they try to dismantle the war economy, in fact, you find that after 1800, there's no war being fought in this region. It completely ends with the, with the advent of the British. And uh, they dismantle the, you know, the war economy and they also put an end to iron smelting. Uh, and in some sense, they also begin to control charcoal completely. One reason could be to prevent people from making weapons. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, uh, people were not allowed to take even bamboo from forests and so on for charcoal making. And they had to do it with the consent of the forest uh, department. Even today, they do make charcoal. So if you go uh, Chitradurga and uh, Tumkur district, you find they make charcoal even today. Uh, so, and surprisingly, these are made for tandoors and so on. And uh, surprisingly, when they have to uh, send it to Bangalore, they still require the seal of the forest department. So that, that practice continues. I think uh, charcoal is, you know, something which is controlled in a sense by the state in order to prevent uh, uh, its being used uh, for, for weapon making. And the British also destroy weapons uh, en masse. Uh, they take swords, break them down, they dismantle the forts. Uh, so I think they control, one, one way to control that entire weapon making industry was was through the control of charcoal. So yeah, the, this was one of, I think, uh, most exciting uh, discoveries along uh, Buchanan's route. Uh, very recently, we went to a place called Gattipura, very, very close to Bangalore. Uh, and it's amazing because, you know, when Buchanan sort of, you wonder where Ayan, he speaks about a hill and you don't see any hills there. And as you reach Gattipura, the picture on the right, you suddenly find a small hill which is black. There's nothing on it. There's no no trees, nothing on it. And uh, uh, that's where the smelting took place. And this was a very important smelting uh, uh, place where they would supply the, the iron ore to, sorry, the iron to uh, Tipu Sultan, who would then convert it into weapons at Karkhanas and so on uh, for weapon making. Uh, yeah, but today, unfortunately, when you go to these places, when you talk about iron ore, people are a little sensitive. Uh, so they don't tell you uh, that anything about it. They're scared to speak about it. Uh, but we got some help and they opened up and they actually told us their furnace is there. And uh, an old person from the village took us to the fields. But uh, unfortunately, we couldn't find the furnaces. He said maybe it's been uh, destroyed very recently. So Gatipura, you uh, apparently the uh, you know uh, you could find furnaces up to ten years ago or fifteen years ago, not used but remnants of it. And the fields along Gatipura, you can see are completely black. Uh, you know, if you dig a little bit of the soil, you'll find slag. You'll find a lot of uh, you know uh, remnants of iron smelting. So yeah, this was one of the I think uh, major work that we did. Uh, there are lots of, you know, uh, retracing the journey has been a uh, great experience for me and many of my fellow travelers, both off-road, on-road. Uh, you know, I think it's been a great learning experience, great fun. Uh, I remember once uh, Buchanan says somewhere that, you know, uh, people in India have a very different sense of distance. For uh, That's what he mentions. And we decided to see what he meant by it. So we stopped by, we asked a person, we were somewhere near a place called Hulier, I think. And we asked this person, how far is Hulier from this, from here? And he said, five rupees. So <laughs> I think what mattered to him was the bus fare. Okay, didn't, the distance didn't matter in terms of kilometers. I think the time didn't matter. What mattered was five rupees. So yeah, uh, you know, a lot of places we would... Uh, just like to know, you know, uh, whether there's some truth to what he's saying. Uh, it's fascinating because even when he talks about landscapes, right? When you're traveling very often, you don't bother about landscapes changing, for instance. And these are very dry, arid landscapes. It's not like the Himalayas or, you know, uh, something or the Western Ghats or something, right? This is along Tumkur and Pavagada and so on. People wouldn't really spend time, uh, you know, gazing at it. But yeah, when Buchanan says that suddenly the dry landscape gives, you know, gives way to uh, 
very green, uh, what they call verdure, right? Uh, you actually find that it's true. I mean, if you really look at it, the landscapes do change. I mean, it's not, you know, there's, one could really uh, appreciate that also. Okay, so yeah, these are the kinds of things that we've enjoyed doing on our, you know, on our own journey. And like I said, there, you know, I've not done this alone. There are many people who have done this with me. Uh, uh, and I think all of them have enjoyed it. Uh, that's what we remember. I'm sure they have. Uh, yeah, I like to end here. We have not done the entire journey. There's a lot more to do. Uh, like I said, we have not done it in one stretch. But maybe one day we, we would uh, be able to put something together uh, on the entire journey. Okay, thank you. Excellent uh, presentation, Shashi. And I really like the way you drew from uh, whatever his records were, enough data to come up with theories. Uh, but I was just wondering, you spoke of divergence and uh, people's aspirations driving that divergence more than technology. Don't you think uh, the Industrial Revolution was really what caused the explosion in standards of living in Europe and contrast that with how people here are using technology that has been handed down, so to say, for 200 years and the corresponding low standard of living here. I don't think people here have any less aspirations uh, regarding quality of life. Don't you think it is more to do with the technology? I mean, aspirations could lead to people coming up with new technologies, but ultimately it would be technology, don't you think? Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Manor. Uh, yeah, that's what Gunton argues, that uh, unless there is demand for something, right, uh, technology by itself may not result in an improvement on in the standards of living. So one reason, uh, you know, in India could have been uh, caste or you know uh, religion or whatever that we didn't aspire for you know uh, wearing a woolen coat or a coat or something like that right so uh, why why change things why why do you want to work more in order to acquire these things the only thing that people really uh, use their surplus was perhaps for acquire you know uh, precious metals accumulating precious metals and you find that in Buchanan, right? So he talks about shepherds who are very wealthy, actually. He says they're very wealthy. They have, you know, huge amounts of sheep and so on. But they bury their wealth. They acquire gold and bury it. Uh, they don't use it to, you know, uh, in a sense, improve their uh, levels of consumption or something. like that. They don't want to. So we never really, you know, imported too much from the West, right? All throughout history, when you look at it, uh, we were not importing too much from the West. We were only exporting stuff and getting precious metals in return. And a lot of it was just kept as it is. It was not used to buy things from the West either. So what Gunton argues is that it all begins in the 12th and 13th centuries in, in England actually, where people started, the working class started, you know, in the free towns and free cities, right? Uh, started wa wanting to use cutlery, for example, at home, using curtains, uh, you know, having windows in their houses and so on. You don't observe that in India, even... Today, today. Today, yes. Today we are an aspirational society. Not in 1800, right? So uh, the East India Company uh, talks about it several times in their, you know, in their internal discussions that the people here don't want to buy anything that we want to sell. What are we to do? They're trying to sell in India, right? So the whole point is to circulate the money, right? They're not able to do that because what's happening is they're taking it out of the ground in Bolivia and so on. Uh, exporting it to India to buy stuff from here and we are putting it back into the ground here, right? And in fact, Keynes talks about this that, you know, India is the sink of precious metals. Uh, we are not circulating this, right? This, this, is what, this is what was happening. 
But he also, Keynes actually also says that we kept world inflation low because we put these metals back into the ground. Otherwise, they may have caused inflation across the globe. So, yeah, but yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, there is a point there that social wants were, I'm not saying, uh, I don't want to say more or less, but yeah, we, we had a different, I think, approach to life, perhaps. So, a very interesting remarks that you find in the East India Company records where they say that, you know, babies, for example, they've seen babies in small towns and so on. They don't wear clothes, but they have gold ornaments on them. So, you know, and maybe true, right? So, I, it's different, I would say. So, it's one of the drivers of, uh, yeah, standards of living, not only technology. You also need people to want to, you know, acquire goods in that sense, a kind of, yeah. Fascinating as usual. And uh, no, this is something like an interdisciplinary study. You know, today we talk about a lot of uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies. I think you have covered the entire gamut from not only history, economic, economics, metallurgy, you know, etc. Now, you know, two or three questions I'll ask you, and I'm fascinated sure, sure. by that. I think the initial part you was, you mentioned that Bangalore became green afterwards. You know, uh, it was not so green maybe in the initial stages. And the surrounding areas probably are still arid. Uh, so, is it only because of uh, forestation that the fact that uh, people took the care to sort of plant trees and etc. in Bangalore that this happened? They do talk about it. It was very systematically planned by the British. Uh, they imported a lot of species and planted them here. Uh, and also for charcoal. So for the railways, for example, and as well as for, you know, uh, uh, charcoal, because Bangalore was growing and charcoal was the best fuel to have at that time. So they do plant trees specifically for this purpose. Okay. And also to sort of replicate their own landscapes, mm -hmm. I think. The other uh, question was, you know, you said uh, the income levels were comparable. Uh, yeah. With uh, what was probably there in Europe. So, uh, you know, if that was so, uh, today we say our productivity is very low, you know, whether it's agricultural productivity or industrial productivity. So, was the agricultural productivity high at that point of time or also comparable? Comparable with this. Comparable. Both the uh, consumption levels. So, what is done in the Great Divergence debate is to define a basket of goods and see how much a worker could, how many baskets he or she could buy. And uh, what I found is that uh, in India, we were consuming approximately the same quantum of, uh, you know, uh, number of baskets. So you don't, uh, you know, necessarily consume all of it, you exchange. So yeah, generally we were able to consume three, four to five baskets, but they were defined in terms of ragi, not rice. Rice was higher priced. So if you take rice as the base, maybe we were just two baskets, but rice wasn't the staple. Uh, it was ragi, uh, at least in erstwhile Mysore. And also just a comment before your next question is that the calorie intakes were not what we think of today. So uh, today we think of 2,500 calories or something like that. So when you read Buchanan's journey, there's qualitative as well as quantitative uh, remarks here that, uh, you know, uh, the consumption would have been maybe 5,000 calories per day. That could have been the average. So he specifically says a hard working person, right, would require about 5,000 calories of food. And uh, this 2,000 calories probably, probably came up much later. Uh, maybe one reason that I've read is to keep wages low, industrial wages low. So I, I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that, but yeah, the levels of consumption were much higher. Okay, so all along Buchanan's journey, uh, shall we? Can we say that there was no poverty really at that point, that period, 1800 to? Uh, what he doesn't speak of poverty. poverty. Uh, I think people appear to be poor. Maybe the British also, you know, uh, because of clothing, right? Even today, when you go to villages, you feel people are poor. They, they may not be. You know, shepherds, for example, are not poor today. Uh, <laughs> I've seen them with uh, wads of cash. So. You know, that's the clothes, for example, might make us think they're poor. Uh, so, yeah, maybe the British also felt. Uh, so, uh, just to 
come back one small remark on, about uh, Manohar's thing on uh, wages, right, and aspiration. So, what they found, you know, while building the railways is that we have a backward bending supply curve. We call it, we we talk about that in economics that when you increase the wages, people actually choose to work less. And they observed this. They tried to get more people to work for the railways and they found that fewer people turn up because when the wages are in increased, people will say that, you know, why work six days a week? We can work four days a week. And they actually observed this. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, the la last question, I mean, one more thing. So, this um, collapse of the sm smelting industry. Yeah. Uh, one thing, of course, is uh, wood, the shortage of wood, when, which you mentioned. But is it also because, uh, I mean, this, because you mentioned Tumkur, this was the area. Yeah, Tumkur, Chitradurga. But yeah. we also have iron ore in Belari and things like that. Right? Sure. Maybe things would have developed there and that uh, the mass production would have killed this industry maybe here. Yeah? No, what we found is that the final blow to the smelters in Tumkur I'm talking about, happened because of Badravati. So okay. that's what a lot of people told us, that it wasn't really imported iron and steel that caused the collapse of the local industry, because the local iron and steel still had a few properties which were suitable for agricultural implements and so on. There was a demand for it, uh, but Badravati makes makes it very easy to get this. And uh, the quality of steel was very good. Right? Very good. And by the way, Badravati also used charcoal as uh, for smelting. But it was more planned in that sense. So they had captive, uh, you know, trees and so on to make charcoal. It was a charcoal based uh, steel yeah. plant. Thanks, Shashi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Shashi. That was fascinating. Just a few points. Uh, I found your finding about wage rates and that they were on par with India. Now, this is consistent with Angus Madison's work. He's looked at the global GDP yeah. across. And in 1800, India was 25% of global GDP. So, obviously, we need a lot more. But these things are consistent. And it also talks about how, if this is a baseline, what happened later and what led to all those changes. On agricultural productivity, have you seen the work of Nilamba Hatti? Nilambar Hatti has... Yeah, I know. It came uh, yeah. later though, yeah. It came later. But one of the things he does is an analysis of the accounts of who was the Divan of uh, Tipu and later the British. Sort of uh, Punaya. 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 Who had land in Yalandu, which he says was well watered at that time. And from that he found out it was prosperous. Today it's dry. There's a lot of change. But all this tries to show that uh, we had a, given the technology and conditions at the time. So, once this is established as a base, the question then becomes what happened later in 200 years. That's a very different uh, kind of issue. Now, I just wanted to comment on the fact that other pieces of work. Of course, yeah. The time. Thank you. But Buchanan, I think, is one of the earliest in that sense, records. 1800. 1800, and that point of time is very important. Exactly. So we are talking about a clear pre-colonial kind of era. Very difficult to measure agricultural productivity from Buchanan because you have irrigated lands, non-irrigated lands. You have so many varieties of land and so many varieties of crops. But uh, I tried to make some estimates and used whatever data we could find. Because otherwise, it's unutilized in some sense. I came a bit late. Uh, I don't know if you already answered this question, so I'm repeating it. Uh, the intention of Buchanan journey, when I when we read his uh, first chapter, it gives an idea that uh, British wanted to know where all the wealth which can be tapped, isn't it? Right. Uh, and that was that's actually it started with a bad intention, but of course we got a very good book from Buchanan on the uh, anthropology. So. Uh, that's my question for me, like what's the problem? So practical problem we're facing is the source for the, uh, for reading this book. So it's all this old font, uh, 
uh, text books are there, which is very difficult to read. There are not complete. Is there any text based source available for this book for all the volumes? Uh, text based, I don't understand. Uh, text based means some kind of a um, um, ask in, 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 in form of ask AR Unicode so that we can read it as a ebook. See, the, what's happening is they're scanning the old available books and reprinting that books. Right. So is there any proper uh, text means I mean to say like uh, it's a computer, it's more in terms of computer, uh, this thing, so that where we can read it as and search, search within the text. So ah, okay, ask okay. it text which is there available for this. Has I anyone has done it? I am not coming to I keep manually searching. <laughs> so yeah, that's the problem I am facing actually. I had to okay. search manually. So oh. if I can search using the text. I don't know email, if someone else has come across it, maybe. Because uh, ebooks are not there for the all these. Uh, may manuals. not be, no. Ebooks uh, are not there. No. I'm and not even sure. the printed one which they have is very difficult to read. The most of the characters are not clearly visible. Really? That, I didn't find that problem, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether you can do a search like you're saying. Yeah. If I come across it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see. Uh, sir, is there any, see actually, uh, the book on Chennai started from Chennai, then he traveled to Mysore, then Bangalore, Kolar, uh, then South Kendra, yeah. North Mayalabar, and further he reached Chennai. So you selected only particular uh, places only. Is there any future plans? From yeah, I have not done, especially the Tamil Nadu part, uh, Satyamangalam and that area I have not covered and uh, Malabar also we have not covered too much. Okay. And uh, the I problem is when you do it in one stretch, you don't learn too much in the sense you keep uh, stopping by places and saying, you know, what do you really say, right? So uh, what happens is if you want some kind of uh, depth into the whole thing, it takes time. Okay, I want to mention one thing. I want to, my family origin, I think, uh, is uh, written in this book, my journey. Yes. Uh, in Tumkur region, in the part volume one, there is a mention Kari Basapar, that Swami is, uh, is our family language. So while you're tracing that, I came to know that I called you. That yes, exactly. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, Shiv's family actually has been mentioned in Buchanan's journey. So at some point, I'd definitely like to. Uh, visit his uh, hometown and see what we can learn. But sh he himself is doing some work on Buchanan, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you.